So welcome everyone, uh, and we have the great pleasure of having Professor Arina Zinuk from University of California, Irvine. And I would only say this, I know Professor Zinuk for a very long time. It's my absolute honor to have her um, uh, on board uh, today and uh, tell her about, tell about her amazing work, quite broadly spanning, but I think today she's going to focus more on hydrogen uh, economy and hydrogen energy in that context. With that, uh, let me hand it over to Debanjali, uh, who is the chapter president, I'm going to formally introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mukherjee. Let me share my screen. Is it visible? Okay. Yes. Okay. So, uh, hello, everyone. Welcome back to our webinar series. I am Dibanjali Chatterjee, a second year PhD student at the Energy and Transport Sciences Lab and president of the ECS Purdue student chapter. I would first like to introduce our chapter advisory board. We are led by Professor Partha Mukherjee from the School of Mechanical Engineering at Purdue, who is our lead faculty advisor. Dr. Judy Jeevarajan, corporate fellow and vice president of research at Underwriters Labs is our distinguished industry advisor. We also have Professor Rebecca Chase from the School of Mechanical Engineering and Professor Julia Laskin from the Department of Chemistry at Purdue as our co-faculty advisors. Let me present a quick overview of our chapter activities over the past year. In spring 2021, we conducted our signature webinar series on women in electrochemical sciences and engineering. Comprising of a stellar lineup of women researchers from industry, national labs and academia, both in the US and abroad, this series was exceptionally well received and appreciated in the scientific community. Inspired by its success, in fall 2021, we launched a webinar series on one of the hot topics in energy storage research, solid state batteries and electrochemistry, inviting some of the leading academic and industry experts in this area. We are proud to announce that for our efforts in actively promoting scientific engagement and outreach on a global scale, we were awarded the 2021 Chapter of Excellence by the Electrochemical Society. The theme of this year's webinar series is Modeling, Characterization, and Analytics in Electrochemical Energy Systems, abbreviated as MOCA. Today's speaker is Professor Irina Zenyuk from UC Irvine. Professor Zenyuk holds a BS in Mechanical Engineering from the New York University Tandon School of Engineering. She continued her studies at, at Carnegie Mellon University, where she earned her MS and PhD in Mechanical Engineering. Her graduate work focused on fundamental understanding of electric double layers in electrochemical energy conversion systems. After a postdoctoral fellowship at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in the Electrochemical Technologies Group, she joined the faculty of the Mechanical Engineering Department at Tufts University in 2015. In July 2018, she joined the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the University of California, Irvine, where she is also an Associate Director of the National Fuel Cell Research Center. Her group works on enabling energy solutions by researching low temperature hydrogen fuel cells, lithium metal batteries, and electrolyzers. Professor Zenyuk is a recipient of the NSF Carrier Award, Interpol Society Fraunhofer Award for Young Researchers, Research Corporation for Science Advancement, Silog Fellow in Advanced Energy Storage, Electrochemical Society Toyota Young Investigator Award, UCI Samueli School of Engineering Early Career Faculty Excellence in Research Award, and the ECS Energy Technology Division Srinivasan Young Investigator Award, to name a few. She has published over 70 journal publications and delivered more than 80 invited presentations on topics of energy storage and conversion. Today, she will be speaking on realizing hydrogen economy and rethinking catalyst layer design, interplay between activity and durability for polymer electrolyte fuel cells. Professor Zenyo, we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Devanjali, very much for this nice introduction. I'm, um, I'm really excited to be featured here in this seminar series. I've been following your chapter activities uh, for a while through the Twitter feed, and I'm really impressed what you've been doing for science, for diversity. Um, some of the, you, you've, you had some of the best seminar series in electrochemistry, so congratulations. And, and rightfully so, you won that ECS 2021 Excellence Chapter Award, rightfully so. Um, I'm, I'm, really, uh, I'm really happy for you, and I hope um, 
we'll see more chapters like yours throughout uh, the, the country. Um, so today's talk um, uh, is about hydrogen economy and also fuel cells and catalyst layers and durability. Um, thinking of a hydrogen economy, now is the time to think about it because um, you will see that um, in the United States, uh, Biden's infrastructure bill has uh, has 8.5 billion dollars for regional hydrogen hubs so uh, this money will be dispersed uh, hopefully within this year and so we will see a large boom in deployment of uh, hydrogen economy here in the united states which which already happening in europe so um so i think it's really a good time to to talk about this um uh, overall uh, hydrogen strategies and also what are the challenges from more scientific point of view so my talk is generally will be divided uh, into two sections one i'll talk just generally about hydrogen economy hydrogen and properties and the second part of the talk will be more technical focusing on dur durability and degradation of uh, of catalyst layers um, in fuel cells so uh, before starting i want to introduce where i come from uh, i come from university of california irvine it's a public university we are one of um, uc campuses so this is a white line outlines here uh, the campus territory so you can see we're a few miles away from some of the best beaches in the u.s uh, people come here for vacation. Um, our fuel cell, National Fuel Cell Research Center, is located in the center of the campus. So is the newest Koriba Institute for Mobility Connectivity, another center that was established just a year ago. A lot of times we consider it to be number one full school. Why? Because of sustainability efforts that happen on campus. We have a large microgrid, we have solar installations, so we can plug and play with various technologies uh, deployment at the grid. So um, if you think about first uh, power to gas implementation of 60 kilowatt electrolyzers um, on the microgrid that happened here in UC Irvine, this is now hydrogen electrolyzer. Um, in terms of uh, hydrogen refueling station, we have been mostly used hydrogen refueling station in the last 20 years or so. You can see a lot of fuel cell cars here in Irvine because of hydrogen infrastructure. Um, you, we have on campus, we have nine electric buses and one hydrogen fuel cell bus. And our mission is to facilitate and accelerate development, deployment, advanced power energy systems. We are 20 year old center, Professor Jack Brower, director, I'm associate director. And, um, and it's, been, it's, it's been great to, to be here for three years and to, to see a lot of hydrogen projects being developed and deployed. So what, what is so special about hydrogen? If you think about uh, where, it, where it's placed on this volumetric density versus gravimetric density. Um, hydrogen has really high gravimetric density, right? But, um, but volumetric density is quite low. What, what does it mean? It means you need to have large tanks for equivalent uh, diesel versus hydrogen. You will need much larger tank for hydrogen to, to reach the same, um, to reach the same uh, uh, energy density. So, um, but gravimetric density is, is really high because hydrogen is so light. Um, typically, hydrogen is being stored uh, in high compression cylinders or uh, stored as liquid hydrogen. For example, for aviation um, scenarios, we are considering uh, liquid hydrogen uh, storage um, or even ammonia. Um, so uh, that way, one can increase the volumetric density. Uh, in terms of how is hydrogen being produced, uh, most of it is still produced through steam methane reforming, meaning uh, we still emit CO2 when producing hydrogen. Only currently 1% producing for, from electrolysis. Uh, we produce a lot of hydrogen. Most of it goes into industrial application, uh, manufacturing of chemicals, um, and some other uh, technologies. So um, if you think about DOE has issued several earth shots this year. So hydrogen earth shot was one of them. And the target was one, 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 one dollar uh, per one kilogram of hydrogen, one decade. It's a steep target because until then, uh, most um, targets were around two dollars per kilogram to the, the the cost to produce hydrogen. Um, where we are, uh, if you think about electrolysis, this is clean way to produce hydrogen. You split water um, and using a solar or using solar or wind. You can see it's around uh, six to eight dollars, right? So it's pretty pretty expensive. Um, if you think about where steam methane reforming is, 
um, is somewhere here without uh, carbon capture storage, a little bit more expensive with carbon capture storage. So the current goal is to be half of the cost of steam methane reforming, which is quite ambitious goal, but we have one decade to reach it. So that's what uh, currently everyone is working towards. Uh, electrolysis and ensuring that this production can be um, met in this one dollar per kilogram. Um, I like to show this slide because um, it's kind of cool, uh, cool schematic showing um, how currently hydrogen is being produced through steam methane reforming, emitting CO2, and how is the future of hydrogen production will look like. So we have renewable energy, power generation, either solar, wind, you can think nuclear. And then you can use electrolyzers to produce hydrogen. You can transport it through natural gas pipelines. Uh, currently, um, in California, uh, there is a legislature to put the regulations in place to have like 5% hydrogen in natural gas pipelines. We also have dedicated hydrogen pipelines here. For example, uh, ports, right? Port of LA and Port of Long Beach, they have hydrogen uh, dedicated um, pipelines. Um, then um, so then also liquid hydrogen can be transported through trucks or, or shipping. And of course, long duration storage, there's something for grid energy storage. If you think about lithium ion batteries, they're effective or some other batteries are effective short duration. If you if you are to think about seasonal storage, what can we do about seasonal storage? For example, in California, we have more uh, we have more solar. So essentially we have more solar in summer and we can store it in, in salt caverns, for example. You can store hydrogen in depleted uh, natural gas fields or in salt caverns and then use it in winter when we has, have less solar. In the United States, uh, you're in the Midwest, that's where wind will be prevailing and you'll have more wind in winter. So again, you can store the hydrogen generated through electrolysis um, in, in underground caverns and use it um, um, in, in summer, for example. So. In terms of where hydrogen is being used, chemical manufacturing is a large industry, right? Um, then also hydrogen can be used for heating uh, in urban houses and can also be used for, um, for example, on the gas stoves to substitute natural gas. Honestly, I I'm still, if you burn hydrogen, you emit NOx and NOx is a greenhouse gas. So um, I, I don't, Personally, I don't feel like we should be burning hydrogen. I think uh, uh, I think we should have electric stoves, and, and yes, the prices of electricity are still high, but eventually we should just have electric uh, heating here, specifically in California, when the, the temperature is so great, there is no need to burn hydrogen emit NOx. So I'm although I'm pro-hydrogen, I, I think we should be pretty reasonable what batteries can do, and batteries, I mean, the battery has been doing amazingly well, so we should, we should target those sectors where actually batteries cannot uh, do a good job. Maybe like shipping, aviation, long duration aviation, more like um, chemical industry and let, uh, let the markets where, high, where batteries are more fit dominate by batteries. So um, it's, uh, <laughs> there's always this uh, somehow a competition between various technologies. So if you work in all the technologies, you just have to be more objective. This is to show you, if you haven't read this, I. I I highly recommend, you should definitely read it. National Academy of Science, Engineering, Medicine report on uh, how, to, uh, how to reach decarbonization uh, strategies of United States by 2030. The ultimate goal is 2050. This was a part, part one of, of report that, um, that focuses on goals to reach by 2030. So if you think about this report, um, you will see how how they address every sector first of all industrial grid transportation uh, building efficiency agriculture uh, and, and promoting equity and inclusion how we can do this and bringing everybody in uh, specifically underrepresented communities if you think of of who is, who who suffers most from pollution those are the, the the communities urban communities that live near ports here, Port of LA, Port of Long Beach, there is large pollution coming from all the shipping and trucking, and those are the communities that have the worst air pollution. California actually has really bad air pollution. <laughs> so, so while while we try to decarbonize those ports, we need to make sure these communities are on board. And 
if, if everything will be electrified, we, we want, want to make sure that they can afford those electricity costs and things like that. So uh, actually, a NASA report um, set up this um, goal, uh, how to reach uh, net zero emissions by 2050. And if you look at the Biden Biden's pledge a year ago, essentially, the, his administration follows this NASA report and shows uh, how we're going to slash CO2 emissions. Um, so, um, so I think we are living in good time now to to focus on decarbonization and uh, focus on clean energy technologies. And um, although now with the war, Russian war, um, the the European uh, pledges for pa in Paris, what happened in Paris, uh, might be actually challenging to reach now because uh, Europe depends on on Russian natural natural gas uh, a lot. Like Germany has fifty five percent imports of natural gas from from Russia, right? So if they are stop this import, they have to uh, restart their coal power plants. And coal is really stepped back. It's not. <laughs> It's not coal. Coal is really not. We shouldn't be looking forward to coal. So I think there is a dilemma currently. Sure, we should double down on renewables and invest more into renewables, uh, batteries, electrolyzers, uh, other technologies. But we should also think about, for example, how we can help Europe to overcome this energy crisis, so we don't, you know, so they don't pollute um, environment with CO2 from coal plants. So I think it's a challenging time time to be in energy and to make this right decision. So um, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about um, the transportation sector. So um, this is just the vehicle size versus travel distance. So if you, if you look at the light duty vehicles, sedans, buses, even smaller trucks, that's where I believe batteries uh, will dominate. Uh, batteries have, you have recharging stations already everywhere. And um, I think lithium ion batteries already implemented on the market and we will see for example california pledged to um to stop uh, selling internal combustion engines by 2035 so by 2035 you want to buy a car it will be electric car or hydrogen car where fuel cell can can uh, do uh, well it's a uh, class 8 heavy duty trucks um and um and maybe buses um although i i believe batteries might might become competitive in that uh, area soon too <clears throat> so what are the challenges? So if you think about um, um, the, currently, there is large uh, targets in Europe and United States to um, to to deploy um, fuel cells in heavy duty trucks. For example, this one is demonstration project in the port of Lo uh, LA and port Lo of Long Beach. Toyota partnering with Kenworth to have five uh, hydrogen fuel cell trucks uh, carrying goods on the port. You can see uh, currently the cost is a cost is a challenge and durability. And this I'll talk about in the second half of the talk. And refueling stations. So currently in California, we have eight stations for heavy duty vehicles and four meaning like uh, trucks and, and buses and four for trucks. Um, hydrogen cost is still high. And if you think about how, how goods are being transported in, in California, mostly from LA area, this is where all the refueling stations are, to San Francisco area and Sacramento. That's where other refueling stations are. So this distance is around 500 miles. Uh, and essentially, it's possible these trucks are designed to, to drive that distance. In future, where there will be somewhere around Fresno, a few more uh, refueling stations. So, uh, so there can be a possibility to refuel there midway between Sacramento and San Diego. <laughs> With this uh, slide, I will compare diesel truck, uh, hydrogen truck, and battery truck. If you think about um, fuel, um, of course, uh, hydrogen is very light, so fuel weight is quite uh, low. Tank weight, however, is high because this is compressed hydrogen. You have carbon reinforced, uh, I believe, stainless steel tanks, and they have to be really... Um, really uh, strong to hold this high pressure of hydrogen so you can see weight is increased but not as high as battery heavy duty truck and this translates into payload reduction actually with um for class a trucks payload reduction is very minimum for hydrogen trucks compared to battery trucks recharging time is also very low because you can recharge hydrogen similarly to what you do to gasoline 
In terms of batteries, of course, you know, you're <laughs> battery experts, so it takes a little bit longer. However, with superchargers, I believe this time is being pushed to, to smaller amounts. The challenge is the cost. If you see cost breakdown for uh, this, this analysis was done by Kenworth, by the way. So I'm just borrowing their numbers. <clears throat> you can see that um, fuel cost is expensive <coughs> compared to electricity cost and also um, tractor costs. So hydrogen, uh, the fuel cell systems are still expensive and I'll talk about why. So, so fuel cell trucks are more expensive than battery trucks currently. So what are the uh, system costs and what are the targets, right? So this is typically vehicle life expected to be 1.2 million miles. The uh, range is around uh, 600 to 750 miles. Average speed, there is no speed. There, this is mostly for Europe. In the United States, the speed is higher. And end of life is defined as 10% of uh, fuel cell voltage loss. So if we look into targets, the target is to reach 30,000 hours, right, lifetime. And the cost is $60 per kilowatt. So I always like, I'm always curious how these numbers are come to be, right? So, so you can do your own calculations, but essentially, if you look at diesel engine, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> its cost is around $25,000. So then you, you look into horsepowers, diesel engine kind of average 440 horsepower just like that in kilowatts, <laughs> this is the power we need, 390 kilowatts. And then if you divide this by uh, essentially by uh, figure out uh, th this given $25,000, how what is the dollar, how much dollars per kilowatt should be? And turn out the $60 per kilowatt to be, uh, to reach the cost parity of hydrogen truck and diesel truck, you need $60 per kilowatt. So that's how this targets have come up. Uh, <laughs> DOE comes up with this targets, doing this kind of, basic back of an envelope calculation, which makes sense. Where we are currently, we are two, three times higher than that currently. Um, and this is annual production rates. So of course, um, economies of scale work, right? So um, the more trucks we deploy, the lower their cost will be. So eventually, eventually the cost, we might be able to reach this target, but of course we need some more fundamental breakthrough on technology level, okay? <coughs> so, um, <coughs> Platinum. Platinum is used as a catalyst in fuel cells, and there is no way around it currently because um, all the commercial fuel cell systems have platinum group metal catalysts. Of course, there's research in PGM3 catalysts, but uh, it's not going to happen in the next 10 years. Um, so platinum is going to be there. So the question is how much platinum we need and where it comes from. So it mostly comes from South Africa and Russia. Um, if you think about global platinum production 2020, it's 200 metric tons, right? Global production. Um, if you think about catalytic converter in your car, right? Uh, in light duty vehicle, around 10 grams per platinum. For fuel, fuel cell heavy duty trucks, it's not so easy to find this number. So let's, let's say approximate this 156 grams of platinum, right? So, <clears throat> so we need 156 tons uh, per 1 mi million vehicles. So it's fine. It's close to yearly production. That's how much vehicles is projected to be in the next, by 2050, right? So it's a, this one uh, per year, and this one is kind of integral over five years, right? Or not five years, 25 years. Um, so, so we have enough platinum for sure. And if you look at the market where it's currently being used, the jewelry sector is flexible. It can shrink, it can expand. So jewelry is kind of a market that, that can be adjusted. Whereas industrial and automotive, these are the markets that that, that more constant. <clears throat> one, thing, one interesting thing that I learned recently is that uh, iridium production, iridium is used in electrolyzers, is tied, uh, is a byproduct of platinum mining. So it's interesting because um, Electrolyzer industry relies on iridium, right? And so they rely on platinum mining. So, so essentially don't want to slow down in platinum mining because then iridium industry will be hurt and then electrolyzers industry will be hurt. So it's all tight. It's all, it's pretty interesting how, um, how these things work. I'm also learning a lot um, as I get to interact more with various people. So if you think about uh, how can we reach this $60 per kilowatt tar uh, target, you can see that a lot of it, uh, this uh, I highlighted this four areas, is material solution. So you can design uh, better materials, you can reduce platinum loading, 
and uh, through several strategies. And so you can really reduce a lot of um, uh, like $80 eighty dollars reduction because of that of course uh, some larger things are like economies of scale and things like that um let's look at the fuel cell system so fuel cell system consists of four components you have air supply thermal cooling fuel cell stack and fuel supply system so uh, <clears throat> fuel cells are complex because you have uh, you have fuel coming in and water coming out and you have to have the cooling it's, uh, fuel cells operate at high current densities compared to batteries Think about batteries, one and a half milliamps per centimeter square, something here, we talk about one amp per centimeter square. So think about everything from like connecting cables, cables need to be large, uh, heating is a problem. At one amp per centimeter square, you generate a lot of heat. Then um, temperatures, they operate at 80 degrees C or higher. So <laughs> so it's, it's really a much more complex system. Uh, of course, batteries and battery management systems can be complex, but like fuel cell, I think with all these fluxes, it's more like more like you think about more like engines and the complexity of engines, right? Thermal engines. So all the components are around fifty dollars per kilowatt, and stack itself is hundred thirty three dollars per kilowatt. So if we want to reduce the cost, let's focus on fuel cell stack. So what's inside the stack? You have cells. You have like let's say Toyota Mirai has three hundred uh, cells uh, stacked together into stack, right? Uh, in series. So you have. Um, you have components that are catalyst layer, membrane, you have hydrogen coming on one side, oxygen on another, and key is a catalyst layer. That's where you have nanoparticles of platinum dispersed on carbon. And because oxygen reduction reaction happens, you, you need oxygen, protons, and electrons to meet at the active site, right? And you form water. So, so this is called kind of triple phase boundary. So electrons conducted by platinum, oxygen through pore space, and protons through this ionomer. So it's a it's a, a perfluorinated uh, ionomer such as napion. They act as binder. They act as proton conductor, right? So you think about this typical polarization curve, voltage versus current density. <coughs> and uh, for heavy duty operating range, we will be working at high voltages to achieve high fuel efficiency, the higher the voltage, but lower current density. So our stacks will be larger, probably. This is the heavy duty stack break breakdown. What are the components at, at the economies of scale? 60% of cost will be catalyst. 60% of the cost will be this platinum catalyst. That's kind of, that's how it's going to look like. So, so we really need to reduce platinum amount without sacrificing any other performance. So, so what's been done historically? So now we're just gonna transition more about uh, reviewing what's been done in literature. Um, if you look into materials research community, they done amazing, amazing job developing new catalysts. So you have the nano uh, platinum alloy catalysts that are nano frames, octahedrals. You have tin films. <laughs> you have some ordered into metallics. Uh, you have all kinds of other catalysts, and this is their mass activity. That's how they evaluated how uh, essentially how active they are. And the gray shows in simple setups such as rotating disk electrodes. So this is simple pre-screening tool, electrochemical tool you can use to evaluate your catalyst, or you can put them into membrane electrode assembly and test them in the fuel cell. So what you see here is um, is <laughs> The performance is amazing in RDE, right? You have a huge mass activity. The moment you put them in actual fuel cell, they don't work. Why? Well, um, rotating disk electrode uh, setups, typically you have working counter-reference electrode, you bubble hydrogen, oxygen, for example, oxygen reduction reaction, and you deposit a thin film on the tip of this rotating disk. Um, in, in fuel cells, you make a catalyst layer, which is your catalyst, your support, your ionomer, you no longer have accessibility of acid. You rely on ionomer for transport. You have, um, it's not as pure of system as RDE. And, um, and this, this has been a mystery. And this is something the field has been working on to explain why do we have this huge reduction in, in mass activity the moment we integrate this beautiful catalyst into membrane electrode assembly. And part of it, part of the problem is that the ionomer has the sulfonic acid groups they negatively charged, they absorb on platinum and they poison the surface and they block oxygen from reaching the surface. So, so part of it is this ionomer uh, coated catalyst actually, <coughs> actually gets poisoned. And this is, 
This is actually uh, what the field has been working on for the last few years. The whole idea is perhaps we don't need new materials. We need to learn how to integrate them into membrane electrode assemblies. Of course, material scientists will say, okay, this is engineering challenge is not interesting. You engineers do this. And, <laughs> and uh, for us engineers, I mean, this, this is really difficult thing to do, uh, to, to make these composite layers and to make sure that, uh, that uh, transport, reaction kinetics, water management, all of them play a role. And, and specifically degradation, you always have this kind of trade-off between degradation and activity, right? So what are the degradation mechanisms? As you operate fuel cell, you, you cycle it in potential range where platinum oxidizes and redeposits. So you have con continuous platinum dissolution, and then it's redeposits from smaller particles onto large particles, which is called Oswald ripening. This is thermodynamic phenomena where larger particles have smaller surface energy. So essentially, you want platinum wants to deposit onto those. Then you can lose platinum area through agglomeration. Think about why do we care about platinum particle size? Because uh, reaction happens on the surface. So it's not the volume of particle matters, right? Like intercalation in, in lithium ion batteries. Here, surface matters. So how much surface you have exposed, that's the only thing matters. All the atoms within these nanoparticles don't participate in reaction. So you want to maximize your surface area. That's why smaller particles are better. And larger particles have smaller surface to volume ratio, right? So essentially, as you operate fuel cell, your particles will, will become larger and larger. You're going to start losing the surface area, and then you start losing uh, um, performance, right? So there are several mechanisms. <laughs> this paper comes from Toyota, essentially, um, how we can manage the degradation. First of all, this is what already Toyota cars are doing. You're setting upper limit on voltage. Essentially, most of the degradation happens at upper voltage, so you can clip it, right? You can clip it, system level, right? Then material solution, you can play with this um, metal alloys. So for example, nickel or, or cobalt, platinum, nickel, platinum, cobalt are most active currently. Um, M ratio, the, the higher the M ratio, the kind of the better activity, but the worse durability. So you can play with that, optimize it, find the optimal one. You can do ordered platinum uh, intermetallics. This has shown recently in a few years to be the most promising catalyst for durability because kind of this order structures tend to not to dissolve much. You can use some kind of uh, dopants, uh, melamine, some other soft matter ionic liquids to to cover the catalyst to prevent it from dissolution. You can, you can build new support materials so platinum is anchored better so it doesn't move around. And then you can also obviously uh, try to make uh, larger particles of platinum and make it because they are more stable. So with larger particles, you have you lose some obviously loading, but but there are some trade-offs in terms of activity. So now I'll uh, with the last um, with the last 15 minutes or so, um, I will talk about um, what we do in our group in terms of durability. So this is kind of cycling um, accelerated stress test the department of energy developed for fuel cells so you cycle from 0.6 volts to 0.95 volts so what happens in this window is platinum surface gets oxidized first you build platinum oh on the surface and then you build platinum oxide on the surface and then you reduce this platinum oxide so platinum uh, ions leave the surface and uh, essentially that's where degradation happens when you do this uh, um, cathodic sweep from 0.95 volts to 0.6 volts that's where you lose a lot of platinum so so we wanted to understand various things uh, how um, uh, because the literature already has a lot of studies on on platinum degradation itself we wanted to do more of engineering work to understand how other components affect uh, platinum degradation other components in actual fuel cell okay and we did a lot of characterization. We have access to synchrotrons. We have access to, to lab scale, electrochemical techniques. So you'll see a lot of characterization then. So uh, this is kind of how the fuel cell looks like. It's a hardware. So you can see this flow field. That's where gas is being delivered to membrane electrode assembly. This is just experimental conditions. Um, I, if you have any questions, I can get, go over through them. OK, so first study, we published two papers on this, uh, two studies. Uh, we were looking at the fact of gas flow fields on platinum degradation. So this is how gas is delivered to catalyst layer. And <laughs> we were using micro XRD in, uh, in advanced light source. 
to map the catalyst layer under this uh, flow flow field. So you can see, and we did a degradation in air and nitrogen. Wet conditions, dry condition. So what we see in dry condition, actually, we don't see anything. Um, we don't see inlet and outlet. Why inlet outlet matters? Because gases come from inlet, they're getting consumed, more water produced. So there is some inlet outlet variations that are interesting. Okay. In dry conditions, we don't see much platinum particle size increase. Why? Because um, think about platinum ions. For them to move around, they need water. They need ionic uh, conductivity, right? So, so ionomers provide that, but ionomer ionic conductivity proportional on relative humidity. So, when we have 100% relative humidity, ionomer is well hydrated. You have a lot of water, so you see uh, platinum moves around. And and what you see here is that under the lens, lens are called. This is graphite lens. You see platinum particle increase, specifically in nitrogen environment. And you can see that uh, it can reach going from three nanometers to 14 nanometers. This is a really large uh, platinum particle size. <coughs> Why? Well, we we think it's because uh, under land locations, uh, their, their uh, catalyst is cooler. Why? Because lands are made out of graphite channels. Which you have just gas flowing. So lands being able to remove heat faster. And then you have water condensation in catalyst layer. And this condensation increases local hydration, and then platinum can move, move more freely. So we found that. We published two papers on this, so that was interesting finding. But then we ask ourselves, OK, this, this is really depending on geometry of flow field. This is one possible configuration. By the way, this is what every lab uses. It's made by Scribner or Fuel Cell Technologies. This is flow field. This is the most commonly used. So we decided, OK, we're going to use the flow field developed by General Motors. It has much narrower lands and channels. And then when we looked at uh, platinum size distribution, we no longer see differences between land and channels. And that kind of gives us, teaches us a lesson that when you have wide lands here, one millimeter, and channels, essentially, you have really homogeneous heat distribution. And that doesn't have degradation. So when you have more, more narrower lands and channels, that kind of uh, yeah, prevents platinum from agglomeration. How is it currently made in, in, in industry flow fields? Well, they're being stamped. So the, the flow fields are to, you have two thin sheets of titanium, you, you stamp them, and then you weld them together in, you have, it's bipolar configuration, you have anode cathode, <laughs> in the middle channel, you have coolant flowing through it. So current technology is limited by stamping process. You cannot really stamp really fine features. You're gonna break the material, right? So it's either stainless steel coated by titanium, or it's titanium coated by, by graphite, really important titanium oxide. So, so um, to realize 0.5 millimeter lens is still probably not feasible. So mostly, mostly stamp, stamping has like around 0.8 millimeters, one millimeters or so. But something interesting to look in future. Next question we had, how do gas diffusion layers uh, impact uh, platinum degradation? So these are <laughs> inert layers. Uh, they're made out of carbon, so um, they have fine microporous layer, which is shown here in orange. So we picked the three from commercial suppliers, and they are very different. So these are the most three used in the industry currently, right? <coughs> you have uh, SGL, you have Freudenberg Afcarb. So you can see one has cracked microporous layer, one has very uniform microporous layer, one has a really embedded porous microporous layer. So you can see por size distributions, you can see porosity, all of this tomography, all of them very different, very different, right? And thickness is the same. We did beginning of life and the end of life evaluation. This plot shows it very well. Performance at the beginning of life and the end of life <laughs> pretty much it doesn't depend on the GDLs. And this is very interesting because there's so much studies that look into the effect of GDLs and we show no, no, no impact, pretty much negative result. Uh, platinum will degrade the same way whether you have this uh, GDL with porous microporous layer or, or not. Um, you can see electrochemical surface area is reduced same way uh, for all three GDLs. This is oxygen transfer resistance the same. Uh, you can see the mass activity is very similar. I mean, so, so we didn't find any, any interesting, we, we found something interesting actually. The flow field we used was this five centimeter square. This is micro XRD plots of the entire area. So you can see a particle size growth mostly at the inlet. We think that's 
somehow correlated to water production, something hidden water management. We don't understand it quite well. <laughs> this is a loading map showing that actually uh, 22 BB SGL loses more platinum than the others. And this is possibly due to SGL having microporous layer cracks. And you can think uh, cracks help uh, water removal from catalyst layer. So water will carry platinum and platinum will leave the system. So, so that's how we started to look into impact of microporous layer. And uh, my student developed this identical location micro XRF technique. So we have a um, local Coriba instrument where we can use 10 micron capillary to really map platinum loading. So this was kind of exciting. Uh, no one has done this before. So this time we used uh, 19,000 cycles. That's kind of heavy duty accelerated stress test protocol. Performance, I mean, from beginning of life to end of life, decreased mass activity reduced, surface area reduced. This is all kind of expected. And these are the micro XRF uh, plots of catalyst layer of platinum inside the catalyst layer. <laughs> and you can see this is loading. Micro XRF captures loading of anode and cathode both. So what we see at the inlet before and after, we see formation of cracks. So all these uh, blue things here are their cracks. At the outlet, we also see a lot of cracks forming in the catalyst layer. And that's because, you know, um, cell undergoes dry out uh, and dehydration dry out those dry wet cycles during operation. And those cause like swelling of membrane and formation of mechanical, mechanical stresses, actually. Loading loss, we did not see any loading loss. So platinum particle size increased, but loading remained the same. Uh, but we did see some interesting movement of in plane of platinum movement, uh, which we found quite interesting, specifically when we have formation of these cracks here, how will platinum redistribute? So that was some interesting finding. But uh, we found also how we found another application of this method. So we, since we were studying effect of crack microporous layer, we, we kind of made microporous layer with like really well-defined cracks, uh, 15 microns each crack, distance one millimeter. So we saw that performance didn't improve with cracks. So black one here is with cracks, red without cracks, beginning of life, end of life. So cracks really hurt the performance. But but what's interesting, it was to look at the catalyst layer micro XRF showing that actually uh, what microporous layer cracks actually uh, does result in platinum loss. And that's interesting. So that confirms our early hypothesis that somehow uh, water probably carries out uh, platinum ions. And so, and you see a lot of cracks forming at the inlet, less so at the outlet, and most of the loss of uh, platinum is in the inlet. So, and this is identical location because there are actually variations uh, of loading uh, within MEAs, within batch to batch. So one really needs to do identical location, uh, XRF. And we, this is the first study to do this. We didn't publish this data yet. This, no one has done this before, but actually the Department of Energy is considering to incorporate this method into their kind of characterization techniques method because it's kind of so useful to see uh, what happens uh, beginning of life, end of life. So it's really, really cool. Um, so lastly, uh, okay, in conclusion, um, we, we looked into platinum degradation, um, looking uh, from perspective of what is a flow field does to it. We found that if you have a flow field that has really wide lens and channels, then it affects platinum degradation, it's not homogeneous. Um, using into the, looking into GDLs, gas diffusion layers don't seem to affect. Uh, platinum degradation, but we found that microporous layers with cracks uh, seem to result in more platinum being lost, carried out from the system, and we think it's just platinum ions being carried by water that leaves the system. And uh, identical location XRF is indeed a promising characterization technique that we'll see hopefully deployed more by other groups. We already adopted it for electrolyzers, so we, we do similar degradation studies on iridium oxide catalyst and, and try to map it beginning of life, end of life. So um, in terms of outlook, where we'll see fuel cell electric vehicles, mostly uh, probably uh, long distance aircraft, heavy duty trucks, trains, ships, the heavy duty industry, chemical industry, um, every, everything below this. And even, even in this industry, batteries can be competitive, but batteries will be dominating this area and actually forklifts plug power for example have this fuel cells for forklifts uh, platinum prices are depending also on the economy and crude oil so it's all interrelated 
Um, and in terms of where we'll see a lot of breakthrough, it's actually this interface between ionomer and platinum. This is critical um, uh, interface and that which, which we need to resolve to reduce platinum loading. Um, this is my group. Our funding is for this project is from Bosch, Sunnyvale. Uh, we, they have an amazing team that we've been working with for three years. We also work with IRD Fuel Cells, Danish company. Uh, imaging is done and micro XRD by Advanced Light Source and uh, of course my group. And um, lastly, you war, Russian war in Ukraine. So we've been um, at UC Irvine, we've been <coughs> working with Scholars at Risk Network to bring um, maybe three, four um, professors, displaced professors here. So we did all this funding, um, uh, raising of funds effort. Currently it's around 52,000. This is outdated uh, crowdsourcing. Um, and then also we have internal commitment from Provost, Vice Chancellor for Research, uh, Deans. So totally we have raised around $200,000 to bring two Ukrainian scholars here. Uh, Department of Energy has also issued a uh, um, dear colleague letter to bring uh, to issue supplemental funds to bring Ukrainian scholars. So it's been it's been a lot of effort, and I feel like there's been a lot of community effort, and community has been super helpful here at UC Irvine to do these things. So I'm pretty grateful for for everything that's been done here. We have also fundraising concert going on, so it's been really really great experience. But we also need to do some things for Ukraine because you know it's uh, the war is devastating for academic community specifically. Kiev and Kharkiv were the two heavily targeted cities, and that's where all the major universities are. That's where the best universities uh, in Ukraine are, and uh, all these thousands of students being displaced currently. And you know, even after war, they'll have to come back and try to rebuild the infrastructure. The the buildings are not there, so the labs and everything. So it's really really difficult situation for scholars. So I think we all need to be mindful and 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 try to help them. And thank you very much for hosting me. I, I enjoyed interacting with you. And um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to share with you my experiences or anything else. Thank you, Irina. It's so wonderful. And, and thanks for uh, putting this up. Uh, really appreciate all your efforts. And I am actually closely following many of those uh, efforts that are doing with respect to Ukraine. So thank you uh, for doing that efforts that are doing so. Uh, the floor is open for questions. And this is, you know, uh, just for the audience, I did my PhD in PEM fuel cells. It's wonderful to see lots of advancements, cool techniques, characterization. So I am not going to ask the first question. I will let others ask. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to start. <laughs> Devangeli, over to you. Are there any questions? Yes, uh, we have some questions in the chat box. So a uh, question from Navneet, um, at present, only 1% hydrogen is produced by electrolysis. Could you please comment on the transition from gray hydrogen to green hydrogen? Um, thank you, Navid. Great question. Um, so um, if, you, if you're reading uh, ECS interface issue uh, magazine, we, we had, I, I highly recommend uh, there's virtual issue on, on hydrogen. Please read it. There's collection of amazing articles from DOE. I, I co-authored, I actually credited that with Nam Danilovich from Berkeley Lab. So gray hydrogen is uh, just to, is for those of you who are not so familiar, gray hydrogen is produced from steam methane reforming without uh, being, uh, where CO2 is not kept. So you can you just release CO2 and green hydrogen, uh, blue hydrogen is when you capture CO2, steam methane reforming with carbon capture storage, and green hydrogen is when you have a, a hydrogen produced from renewable sources with no CO2 emissions. So the pathway from gray to green that's a great question because the only way to produce more green hydrogen is deployment of megawatt scale electrolyzers. So we need demand for hydrogen, and demand for hydrogen is there in industry. So currently, uh, what will happen is that um, we'll see we'll see deployment in California at least. Uh, if you think about this regional hydrogen hubs, California hubs will be probably if we win this this obviously solicitation, there will be green hydrogen hub, renewable hydrogen hub, because we have so much solar here. You'll see other regions in the country relying on nuclear, relying on blue hydrogen, relying uh, on some other things. So uh, so. Um, it's just the deployment of electrolyzers. That's that's what 
needs to, to be done, megawatt scale electrolyzers. And it's been done already in Europe. We see a lot of large deployments here, US, still not there. So I think with this regional hydrogen hubs, uh, we'll see in the next decade megawatts being deployed here. So we really needed those billions of dollars of investment from government to do this. But yeah, 1% is not enough. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so next question is also from Navneet. What is the influence of the wet and dry conditions on the formation of platinum band? Um, yeah, this is a good question. Uh, um, so platinum band uh, forms inside the membrane uh, as, um, so you really feel so person. <laughs> That's good. Um, <laughs> platinum band, you can see it here. So uh, what happens when platinum dissolves it can it can redeposit onto larger particles. It can leave the system with water, or it can move into the membrane. And then, as hydrogen crosses from the anode side, it can reduce this uh, ions, and it can form a uh, platinum band inside the membrane. So uh, the question is the effect of wet and dry conditions. I um, I imagine we will see more platinum bands in wet conditions because that's where platinum mobility is higher. However, I'm not sure, I'm not aware if there is study, systematically studied the effect of uh, relative humidity in platinum band formation. To us, platinum band is sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not there. It's, we do SEM cross-section and, you know, we see it's there. And what's interesting also that XRF uh, will capture this platinum. We'll say we didn't lose platinum loading because through XRF detects all the platinum, but Actually, this platinum is not active. So, uh, so one has to be careful interpreting XRF results. So, yeah, this is this is a really good question. I don't know if you know. Uh, please let me know if you know the study that did the systematic evaluation. Let me know. I'll be happy to learn. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Zikyang. What do you think of the potential of novel catalyst materials or structures, for example, two D materials, in advancing the commercialization of fuel cell vehicles? Um, so, uh, 2D materials, you, you're thinking of like magazines or like Wonder Wall materials. Um, actually, uh, we need um, thin films, uh, like non-structured thin films by 3M were almost commercial. They, they were close to commercialization. So thin film materials powdered platinum on, on organic whiskers. They never managed to overcome uh, water management issues, so they, that's why they were never commercialized, but they were close. To the materials, so there's a lot of effort for PGM-free materials, and I assume these magazines or Wonderwall materials will be PGM-free materials. And uh, those materials, um, you will have their uh, activity and turnover frequencies are inherently lower than platinum materials. So what will happen, you'll, you'll must put more of those materials. So you'll, you'll have thicker catalyst layers, you'll have uh, heavier systems, larger systems, and their performance not going to be as high as platinum-based systems. So think about different applications for vehicles, like with batteries, right? You need you need that lithium-ion battery in, in the car, right, to, to have that horsepower. Same, you need platinum for fuel cells to get that power density at lower weight. For stationary applications, for grid storage, things like that stationary where you don't have to move things i think that's where you'll see deployment of 2d materials thank you uh so we had yeah that's the end of the questions in the chat box wonderful okay. <laughs> Sorry, good question so, I, I don't know if, okay if i may ask a little bit about uh, uh so i mean in this hydrogen in this uh, interface uh, that uh one um, issue that's all about hydrogen right and and also, I, I, I noticed that uh, catalyst degradation or catalyst degradation is still one of the key there in the electrolyzers as well. Uh, so would you like to comment on uh, some of the analogous, uh, perhaps uh, mechanisms slash something very new that we would expect in the context of electrolyzer, uh, catalyst degradation, or any comments that you have? Because that's kind of, catalyst is something I, you know, it tends to think a lot. And then I'm happy to see GDL and MPL and MPL cracks are still these things. So it's very good to hear to see that. Amazing. Because so, you probably did some work in that like back 15 years I know, years ago. it's like, my, you, know? you know, so it's very good to see that. It's still <laughs> such an important, uh, important uh, problem still, you know what I mean? Great to see and, that. 
And in electrolyzers, you'll be surprised. The design of GDL, like porous transport layers, which are titanium, now they're doing perforating them with laser, in, inducing cracks, and that's all been done in fuel cells. Yeah, exactly. Lagos. Oh my God, seriously. Uh, <laughs> that's amazing to see. <laughs> but your question is really good because um, electrolyzers, uh, they are, we, will, we have a lot of funding now in electrolysis. That's kind of the hardest area. Fuel cells kind of. Kind of, they, I mean, it's application, one of applications, but generating hydrogen is the key. You need to generate first hydrogen before we can utilize it. That's why electrolysis now becomes such a critical, uh, you know, critical area of research. And in electrolyzers, you have iridium oxide as a catalyst. So because of high potentials, we cannot use carbon as support. So we use iridium oxide as catalyst. And, okay, first problem is you have tons of suppliers, so every time one buys from different batch, from alpha ISR or something, you get different catalysts. So it's uh, it's been a challenge. So so companies like Nell, they buy kilograms of, of iridium mm -hmm. oxide, right? So they have the same, so so they have some some consistency here. Uh, here is just to, to get the catalyst that has the same properties from previous batch that's already challenged. Then degradation is so complex because iridium oxide undergoes like has four different oxidation states. And depending on potential, and it's it's still uh, still not possible to figure out what's happening. Currently, we use we do everything we did in fuel cells. Now we do in electrolyzers. We use nafion membrane. We use nafion ionomer. Fuel cells moved on to this high hoppy ionomers, high oxygen permeability ionomers that allow oxygen in uh, easily. Same electrolyzers can do the same thing. So we we'll, we we'll, we need to integrate the novel ionomers so oxygen can live better. Then um, then interface. So think about. Um, so here it's interesting because gas diffusion layers have microporous layers for fuel cells. It's been it's been it's been okay years, twenty years more, right? So the, you have this fine microporous layer on top. Electrolyzer industry just uses currently titanium mesh or titanium sintered titanium that is just without microporous layer. So so you have this very bad contact between porous transport layer and catalyst layer. Mm. And to improve that, now the whole field is working on how do you design microporous layer titanium particles and how does that affect transport. So, so it's interesting wow. how the field is pretty much following what the fuel cell field been doing. So, yeah. um, and degradation is is poorly understood, and I think that's where like a lot of effort is going to trying to understand this iridium dissolution, iridium loss to go to low loaded MEAs because. Uh, industry uses still one one to three milligrams per centimeter square electrolyzers, mm -hmm. iridium oxide. Uh, fuel cell industry uses below 0.2 milligrams per centimeter square. So we are one order of magnitude below catalyst loading fuel cells compared to electrolyzers because mm -hmm. fuel cells are really more higher TRL level, I would say, than electrolyzers. So there is a lot of room, a lot of room and modeling, understanding oxygen evolution and transport uh, it, it's huge. I think there is so much potential for for students to to work in this area. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. So I think you kind of answered that. I think that's a, that should uh, excite some of my students here. And, and really, uh, in the interest of, interest of time, probably a fundamental thought I would like to get from you, Irina. Whenever I think about electrolyzers, it's a bubbly system as compared to a droplet system in ten fuel cell. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? When the uh, the bubbles are now what is going to do between the NPL? It's a non-existent NPL now. It's a, uh, iridium oxide G GDL is facing with the catalyst there. So I I, I tend to think about that. So it's fascinating, but I'll let it. I you know I'll let you conclude with your thought. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a it's a uh, so bubble. Uh, so nucleation, growth, and transport. Those are three questions. So nobody knows what is the that nucleation sites, how they look like. What is the that that nucleation radius? what is this how far how how large it grows it's obviously mm. restricted by the pores um there's a lot of lattice boltzmann simulations we also try to do that but lattice mm. boltzmann simulation requires you to input those parameters in and imaging currently a nano ct is limited to 30 nanometers and it's not easy to put actual electrolyzers so you have mm. to design model flat surfaces um uh, so it's it's and and another question is oxygen bubble coverage, how does it affect a catalyst activity? Yes. So mm -hmm. nobody knows. This is a, we have models, we have empirical uh, parameter data that has mm -hmm. some kind of bubble coverage incorporated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is the hardest area of research, I think. And, and oh, wonderful. Good, that, good that you're thinking about this. I think we have the right tools, Parka. <laughs> Thank you, Arina. I think, I think it was just absolutely wonderful. Thank you for sharing your 
amazing work uh, and, and of course um, um, uh, exciting our students so thank you uh, professor Mukherjee, you. Uh, sorry for interrupting we have one last question would we have time to take it please ask professor Zim. yeah sure i'm fine yeah yeah absolutely yeah okay so uh, from francesca what do you think about the potentials of direct solar energy conversion for the production of hydrogen for in for example photoelectrochemistry or photochemistry based methods yeah those of, of course uh, there there is a lisa hub and another hub that address and j j j cap uh, uh, i mean i think uh, well uh, it's there is no commercial device yet right so currents will be very low so there's a lot of advantages because you can have higher efficiency compared to solar panels and electrolyzers but in terms of commercial deployment i think they're still far behind compared to just uh, classic water electrolyzers so i think but i think there's a lot of interesting fundamental questions to answer there so if you're thinking of doing phd in this area go for it if you're thinking of finding job in this area good luck <laughs> If you think about the uh, hottest electrolyzer companies now, Nell Hydrogen, Plug Power, Electric Hydrogen, they're all uh, all hiring uh, super, so, so, so if you have a PhD in electrolyzers, you, you'll find a job immediately because there's not enough PhD students in electrolysis produced currently. But good question, thank you. And thank you for hosting me. I enjoyed this, I enjoy your student chapter. I feel like you. there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of ideas. Uh, and so I can I can see that that center of excellence you have in Purdue. And uh, yeah, I, again, congratulations on all your achievements. And uh, you know, if you have any career, um, need career advice or something, feel feel free to always reach out. You have my email and I'll be happy to, to talk with you. Wonderful, thank you, Irina. I really appreciate all the time that you spent with us today. Devanjali, any concluding comments for Professor Jennifer? Yeah, so uh, th that's all for today. Thank you everyone for attending our webinar and uh, we will see you next Monday. Thank you, Arina. Bye. Bye-bye.